So we've talked a lot in this course about evolution and the process of evolution is connected with the origins of life. Um, and today what I want to get more into the details of are how do we think about evolution in a simple and mathematical way. Um, clearly evolution is a very complicated process with lots of different um, features and, and interactions with environments and between species. Um, but today I want to outline the basic way, the simple way um, in which we constrain sort of what's happening for evolution. So let's begin by thinking of a genome. Um, and instead of thinking of the four nucleotides, let's think about uh, a genome which simply had two different letters, zero and one. So we have this binary genome. Um, and what it is then, what a specific species in this sort of abstract world would be is just one string of zeros and ones of a distinct length. Um, and that forms the genome of, a, of one species, the, the sequence of one species. And what's interesting now is that in this context, we can think about how one string, one genome would change into another um, by just doing uh, switches or, or point mutations to each of the individual zeros or ones um, in this string. Um, and that has sort of an interesting topology because if we imagined a genome of three uh, zeros and ones, so of length three, uh, this is what the structure of mutations from one genome to another looks like. Um, it forms uh, this um, box in this case, so this three-dimensional box, um, where you can go from, say, 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1 by moving, by just changing the last position. And now you can see how many steps each of these different genomes are from each other um, in this sort of complicated space. And what you'd have um, in a genome of arbitrary length L is that you would have, for each of these nodes, L branches um, coming out of that node um, in this sort of hyperspace that would represent um, the way in which you would transition or mutate from one genome to another. All of that being said, how do we start to get a handle on what evolution is actually doing, how evolution is selecting for individual genomes? Well, here we can go back to an old idea of the fitness landscape. And so, again, in this binary language of, of genomes, we could think about writing down every single string um, possible of a, a given length L of zeros and ones. So that would be all these different sequences. And then we can think about measuring the fitness of those sequences in a fixed environment. And so fitness here would mean something like the relative growth rates of all of these different genomes. And so here we now have uh, turned this high dimensional problem into a one dimensional problem of this fitness landscape where we're just assigning how fast everything grows um, as a function of what genome it has. And you can see that in this case, there's a maximum growth rate. So there's a, a point in this fitness landscape where the peak reaches a maximum value. And we might expect that over long periods of time, evolution finds some way to select for that genome over all the rest because it's growing um, more quickly. Um, said another way, it has an advantage over all of the other genomes. And there are easy ways for us to define this process mathematically. And this is actually some of the most traditional mathematical biology um, that we know. So let's look at a simple model um, for this fitness landscape. So the first thing we can do um, is talk about the frequency of a particular sequence. And so we'll call here a particular sequence i. So x sub i is now the frequency of one um, sequence. Um, and so this would really be, for example, the number of individuals of one sequence divided by the total number of individuals. And if we have a large enough population, then we're comfortable talking about this um, as a continuous variable. As um, you could have um, real, real, uh, real numbers for uh, the values of these different frequencies. Um, and then for each of these sequences, we also want to assign a fitness. This is just the relative growth rate. So now we have for one sequence i, these two different characteristics. And for all possible sequences for a genome of length l, we now have a vector of x's um, and f's. So what we can do now is talk about the rate of change of uh, the total abundance or frequency of one sequence. This would be dxi dt, where dt is really measured in generations because we're thinking about entire generations here. Um, and what that would be is some xi times fi. So that's just the frequency times the growth rate. It says how fast you're growing is proportional to your fitness um, and how much abundance you already have um, as one sequence. Um, and then minus some sort of death term, phi xi, um, which is just to ensure that the population size stays fixed. So what we're thinking about here is a very large um, but fixed-sized population um, for which this model applies. 
Um, so what should phi be? We need to find some way to define phi. And what we can do is say that this dxi dt, which equals some growth term minus a death term, um, should also have the property that the total population is not changing in, side, uh, changing in size. Said another way, the sum of all of the individual um, sequence growth rates um, should be zero. And if we use the top equation to expand out this sum below, what we have is that the sum um, of xi fi minus phi times the sum of xi equals zero. And this right-hand term, phi times the sum of xi, um, well, the sum of xi by definition is just one because we're just adding up all of the frequencies. Um, that should sum to one. And so that right-hand term is just phi. And so what this implies is that phi simply equals the sum of xi times fi. Said another way, this is the average fitness of the entire population because we're, we're weighting um, the fitness of each sequence by its overall abundance. And so now we have um, the simple equation again where we have the rate of change of an individual species um, equals this birth term minus this death term where, the, where we now know what the definition for phi is. Okay, great. This now allows us to think about how these different sequences would reproduce on a landscape and how we might select for one frequency. However, we're leaving out one of the most important processes there is, which is mutation. So we know that variation is one of the central pieces of evolution. So how do we get mutation into this model? Well, we can do that by introducing another variable, uh, q sub i comma j, which is the probability of mutating from sequence i to sequence j. And so this is actually a matrix then of every combination between i and j, and it tells us how to mutate from one sequence to another, where all of the entries of this matrix um, are simply probabilities. Putting that all together, we now can write this model, um, which is the full quasi-species model as it's known, for the change of the rate of change of one sequence, where we now have this sum of xj times fj times q minus this death term. And what this first sum is doing is it's taking the growth of each individual strain j, not just the i that we're looking at, but all strains j, and then multiplying that by the, um, the mutation into i. So what we're now doing is we say, let all the strains reproduce and let them mutate. How many of those reproductions and mutations ended up in i? And then there's also an entry in this mutation matrix um, for i with itself. So it has some probability of i reproduces, but then it might also mutate into a strain that's not itself, um, and that gets covered somewhere else in this global system. But now we can add up all the rates of change, and we can tell how the overall frequency of, of sequences uh, changes on this um, fitness landscape. What's important to note is that this QJI is sort of a complicated matrix. Um, going back to this, uh, the topology of how these different sequences are um, connected to one another. So for example, you can see that the probability of 0, 0, 0 going to 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0 is all the same. So if each pointwise mutation, the probability of changing one letter in one generation is the same, then going to any of those three sequences is, is, is the same um, overall probability. However, going from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1 does not have the same probability. Because now what you can see is to get to 1, 1, 1, you have to go through two other nodes to get there. So said another way, you now require three of the letters to change all at once. And if the point-wise, the single um, letter uh, change rate probability um, mutation probability is constant, then it can't also be the case that three changes is the same value. And so given a genome of length L, um, even if everything is just point-wide mutation, we can construct a simple matrix that tells us um, how it is that we change from any given node to any other and construct this Q matrix. Um, in more complicated genetics, we can layer on top of that all sorts of other mutation probabilities um, because it turns out that mutation in some genes is more likely than others for a bunch of complicated reasons. Um, and so we could construct a much more complicated um, value for Q. Uh, now this quasi-species model is useful for analyzing a variety of systems. Um, and in the next few lectures, um, we'll discuss um, ways in which we can use the quasi-species equation to understand something about the limits of evolution and also expand it to a chemical context which is actually where it was originally developed.